Wheels brings you the story of two famous drivers, Denny Hulme and Bruce McLaren. Both were from the small country of New Zealand and went on to great success. Denny was the 1967 world champion and Bruce was a Grand Prix winner who founded the famous racing car company that still bears his name. We continue the story of their racing careers. The year, 1966. Bruce McLaren was in the final year of his long association with Cooper, and Denny Hulm had secured a Grand Prix drive with Jack Brabham's team. Well, Jack had let me drive for him in the Tasman series. He sent a couple of cars down there at various Christmases. So I'd had a little bit of experience, and then in 65 I got a couple of drives and, a Cooper, and the Brabham Climax. And in 66 it was full time, he'd said to me, Dan Gurney's leaving to go and construct his own cars, and you'll be slotting into the team. So there I did, I slotted in the team in 66 and 67. In the period, Jack was quite clever, because during the period of the change of one and a half litre to three litre, Jack got on the bandwagon or got on the job very early and got the Repco Brabham's built in Australia based on the Buick engine and they were away. They basically had a, a suitable sized engine modified here in um, Melbourne and just we got it going and it went very, very well. Um, long before Ferrari managed to get their act together and long came the Cosworths a year or two later. 1966 turned out to be a fantastic year for Brabham, for Hulm and for the Repco Brabham team. Ferrari were dogged by internal politics throughout the season, culminating with the departure of John Surtees. Cooper's big Maserati V12 engine wasn't really competitive until late in the season. Jack went from one victory to another. Denny started the season with the four-cylinder Coventry Climax 2.7-litre engine that had seen service in the Tasman series and intercontinental races. Once he obtained a Repco V8, he too was on the pace, and often it was a Brabham 1-2. For Bruce, it was a difficult season. Robin Hurd had designed a revolutionary composite chassis car for Bruce's first Formula One effort, but the problem was the engine and where to find a competitive one. There was a reduced capacity Ford IndyCar unit, then a Serenissima V8, but neither of these engines was able to do the job. Bruce did manage to score a point in the British Grand Prix, the first in his own car. In Holland, once again, it was a Brabham victory, and by now, Jack was well on his way to setting a very special record of becoming the first, and so far, the only man to win the World Formula One Championship in a car he designed and built himself. One of the greatest challenges for Brabham as a driver was the next race, the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. Denny Hulm backed him superbly throughout the year, learning all the time. By now, there was little to choose between them. Jack had experience and Denny had youthful exuberance, but Jack was a formidable driver. He had his mind set on winning the championship for the third time in 1966. As Denny reveals, Jack was a very different driver to Bruce. Bruce was much more open with all his ideas and uh, socially as well. Jack kept his ideas in his head and, and, and basically I suppose that was fairly good. He sort of sent all the information back to Australia. In sports car racing, the New Zealanders were hard at it too. This is the 1966 Martini Trophy at Silverstone. First Bruce and Chris Amon in the McLarens, and a laughing Denny Hulm at the wheel of the Lola. The Ferrari opposition was led by David Piper. In this race, there was little they could do about Denny's Lola. He carved his way up the field, and the best that the works McLarens team could hope for was second and third places. The 
24 hour of Le Mans in 1966, and the Ford team were properly prepared. It wasn't a question of third time lucky, they'd come with the tools to do the job and set about Le Mans with their new 7 litre engines, determined to succeed. In at Le Mans, it's essential that drivers should cooperate and have the ability to go quickly for the full length of their stints. Teaming Bruce McLaren and Chris Amon together was Ford's masterstroke. These two were well able to take care of the car and drive it just as quickly as necessary. It was a great victory for Ford by the New Zealanders, with Denny Holm and expatriate Englishman Ken Miles coming second in a staged finish. Back on the British scene at a wet Silverstone, Holm once again was showing his skills to good effect in the Sid Taylor-owned Lola T70. The Lola and the McLarens were evenly matched. A great deal of input into the Lola cars was coming from former bike racer and Formula One champion John Surtees and sports car specialist David Hobbs. Bruce McLaren's car building enterprise was spreading itself rather thinly at this time, what with Grand Prix cars, sports cars and Can-Am racing. Denny Hulme enjoys the spoils of victory. Denny Holmes started 1967 with fourth place at the South African Grand Prix and then scored his first Grand Prix win in a tragic race at Monaco when Ferrari driver Lorenzo Bandini was fatally injured. The win brought Denny Holm mixed emotions. It wasn't, it wasn't. Yes, I was having a good dice with Lorenzo Bandini and I saw the accident and all the palaver that went with it. But you know, the hype of me actually winning my first Grand Prix um, I sort of put the Bandini accident behind me at the time. Um, yes, of course it was a sad day, but it was also very exciting for me to win my first Grand Prix at Monte Carlo. Denny's driving style was similar to that of Jack Brabham. He would throw the car around, appearing to use brute force, but it was just his way of driving. The new Ford Cosworth DFV engine was in the Lotus 49s driven by Jim Clark and Graham Hill and provided the biggest challenge to the Repco Brabhams. Clark won at Zandvoort and Holm finished third. Then at Spa, Holm retired. What was it like racing Jack Brabham in his own team? Jack was quite fair in actual fact, but if there was something new, and all I got to say is, in 67, when I won the championship, if Jack had stuck to, or kept, some of the gear that I had, he probably would have won the championship. But he would try something new all the time, like maybe new camshafts, valves or valve springs or something like that, and occasionally they would break and let him down, and I had the good old reliable stuff. Probably not the same horsepower, but reliable, and you've got to be there at the finish. In the French Grand Prix in 1967, the two Lotus 49s of Hill and Clark fought it out with the two Brabhams of Holm and Brabham, and Dan Gurney's New Eagle. Reliability was not always a strong point for the new Ford engine. On the short Le Mans circuit, it was first and second for Repco Brabham, Jack leading Denny to the line with both the Lotuses retiring. Useful points in the championship. The next round was the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Bruce McLaren was at the wheel of one of Dan Gurney's Eagles as he was still trying to find a reliable engine for his own car. Away from the start, and Graham Hill's Lotus 49 looks set for a win in the British Grand Prix. The Repco Brabhams were in third and fourth places behind the two Lotuses. Jack lost his wing mirrors and couldn't see what was going on behind him. McLaren's Eagle was pushed away and Hill retired, leaving Clark to win with Denny Holm in second place. On to the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring with every chance for a repeat of the victory the previous year in the Repco Brabham, a car which was judged to be, if not the fastest Grand Prix car around, certainly the strongest.
during the race, both of the Lotuses had problems, and through to win came Denny Holm. It was his second win of the season and thoroughly well deserved. The championship was fast becoming a match race between two drivers, two drivers from the same team. Although the Lotus was capable of winning, it didn't yet have the reliability that was necessary. In the early stages of the Canadian Grand Prix, the Lotus 49s went well. But as the race wore on in the wet conditions, it was obvious that the Brabhams were equally competitive in the wet. Jack liked the idea of taking another championship, his fourth. Always good in the wet, the veteran Australian was able to get ahead of Denny. Once again, the Repco Brabhams were in first and second places by the time the chequered flag came out. The question now was which of the two were going to win the championship? It had suddenly swung in Jack's favour, but would it stay that way? Second place to Jack Brabham and a retirement for Denny Holm in the Italian Grand Prix meant the championship was wide open once more. Watkins Glen and the US Grand Prix. Once again, the Lotuses were fast. Jack didn't have a good day, a puncture dropping him back to fifth place. But Denny raced on to finish third, the win going to Jim Clark. But, um, yeah, everybody tries hard when they're going to, when they've gotten a half an idea they're going to be the world champion and you won't let anything slip by you get fairly aggressive um, everybody I think gets very aggressive when they know that they, that championship is in, within the grasp and they probably do push people to one side and they've got a tunnel vision when you win it it's a big relief to you and probably a lot of associates around you as well how did Denny rate Jack's skills behind the wheel he was a difficult person to overtake or pass. Later in the year at 67, towards the end, um, we, there was a lack of communication between the two of us, um, less than what there'd been normally, I always thought. But you know, that's Jack's makeup and that's partly my makeup. I'm not that inquisitive. What was it like to beat your own teammate and the man who built the cars to the World Championship? That wasn't easy, particularly when we got to Watkins Glen and there was only Mexico City afterwards to, to go. The mechanics were even slightly divided within the team, and I think that even happens nowadays as well, when there's two good guys in one team trying to win the championship. Uh, less of a problem in that we didn't have so many mechanics. There was two for me and two for Jack. Uh, but Jack, once again, was still um, giving himself the best parts but then sometimes they were a bit fragile and weren't properly tested, so I probably had, in the end, the better opportunity to win the championship. By finishing third in the US Grand Prix, Denny Holm secured the 1967 World Championship. Denny Holm's 1967 World Championship was at the expense of his racing boss, Jack Brabham. How did Jack feel about it? Well, Danny uh, was an extremely good driver and he was coming on at that stage and um, he'd been in our team for a little while and uh, it was a real touch and go thing at the end of the year uh, as to who was going to win the championship. But we had two good cars, two good drivers and we were finishing 1-2 and right up the front all the time but uh, as it turned out in the end, Danny was first and I was second in the championship. But for Repco and the team, it was a good result. For me, Richard, really what I wanted to do was just win the championship. Um, I wasn't terribly sociable towards the press, hence I got the name The Bear, being aggressive and so everybody would stay away from me. The only thing I wanted to do was be the fastest against the stopwatch and I suppose in lots of ways I stood on a lot of people to get to the championship. You know, I knew it was going to be one of the few opportunities I'd ever get to be champion and when you get that close, you do push everything one side. Having won it, I didn't make the best of it. I realise that now, and I'm still 
get this anti-feeling that comes across if the press hound me and push me around. Um, I'm very suspicious all the time of, of the way they write and the way they carry on. And I suppose it was to my detriment that I didn't be more friendly. I felt that I did fairly well in three years in Formula One and your world champion. I tell you, it's a lot harder than that nowadays for any of the drivers to do that. So it was, it was very good. My biggest regret is I didn't win the championship in 68 when I switched to Bruce McLaren. I got close and it was right up to Mexico and I might have even done it, but it wasn't to be. In 1968, Denny joined his fellow Kiwi, Bruce McLaren. Was it difficult to leave Brabham? What happened there, in 1967, I'd asked Jack, could I join Bruce for 67 series of the Can-Am races? And I would be one of the few drivers that actually drove for two professional teams in the one year. And I went to America for Bruce in all the Can-Am races and thoroughly enjoyed it. And of course, my time with Bruce got stronger. The longer we went, we got stronger together. And I decided that there would be a place, or Bruce decided as well, there would be a place for me in his Formula One team, his new Formula One team. So I was quite excited about this, and he, I knew he was going to get the new Cosworth, and it looked the best on paper anyway. So I'd left Jack. Yes, it sounds a silly thing to do, but in actual fact, Jack didn't go so well after that, not because I left, but because the he stuck with the Repco, and the competition got so strong with the... Um, Cosworth, so I made the right decision, I feel. And plus I had a very good time with Bruce, even after Bruce's death. We still have a good time, had a good time in the team, won a lot more races, particularly in Can-Am, and I reckon I made the right decision. As sad as it might have seemed and the wrong decision to a lot of people, but I think it was the right decision for me. In 1968, when he finished races, Denny was always in the points. There were two wins, but that and the points earned from minor places weren't enough for him to take the World Championship. Equally, Bruce had a solid season. His car wasn't as reliable, but he had a number of places and one very important win. His last Grand Prix win, the Belgian Grand Prix of 1968. That was at Spa, one of the most difficult circuits in the world, then at its most dangerous full length. In 68 also saw the death of Scotsman Jim Clark in a Formula 2 race at Hockenheim, the coming of age of another Scot, Jackie Stewart, and the dogged persistence of Graham Hill to take the World Championship, but the McLarens had acquitted themselves well. Over in North America, the Can-Am series was becoming known as the Bruce and Denny Show, and not without good reason. I enjoyed the Can-Am cars more, probably. They were much more exciting. The formula was virtually free. The people, the American people, were much more enthusiastic than what it seemed like the Formula One people were. And um, certainly the money was a hell of a lot better than Formula One as well. And we could probably go across there and get a one-two. It was it's very difficult to get a one-two in Formula One. Occasionally we managed it. But uh, I thought the Can-Am cars were the best that I'd driven, and I still do. He had more fun driving these than anything else. Well, they, they were certainly much more fun. You could go out and knock a second off and then go out next practice session and probably knock two or three seconds off. And yet, they were, when they went supercharged or turbocharged, it's just that you know, the harder you pushed your foot down, the faster the things went. And you, I don't think you ever really found out the optimum, just exactly how fast they could go. By now, production of the Can-Am McLarens was in full swing and the cars were totally dominant in the hands of McLaren and Holm. Bruce's approach to driving was entirely different to that of Denny. He was much more gentle without the lurid power slides and the excitement that Denny provided, whereas Denny used all that power to considerable effect. Bruce won the Can-Am Championship in 67, Denny won it in 68, and Bruce in 1969. Denny drove one of the big sports cars again years later. I went to Germany and drove the Can-Am car that actually Peter Everson won the Can-Am Championship in 71 with. And it was like I'd never been away from the car, it was 20 odd years old. But it's absolutely immaculate like the day we sold it. And it's beautiful to get back into. I say that because it was a works car, a factory car, and I'd probably driven it, tested it, and driven it in one or two races before Peter got hold of it. 
So um, very enjoyable. The, the engine's probably got slightly more horsepower than what we had, but everything's just lovely. I thoroughly enjoy going back and driving Canyon cars. And surprisingly enough, they're not daunting to me. Tragically, on the eve of the 1970 season, Bruce McLaren was killed while testing a new Can-Am car at Goodwood. But despite the devastation of losing its leading light, the team carried on and continues to be a major force in Formula One to this day. Back in 1970, Dan Gurney joined them for some of the races, Peter Gethin for others. In spite of their problems, compounded when Denny suffered serious burns to his hands at Indianapolis, the team pressed on. In Grand Prix racing, it wasn't an easy ride, but nevertheless, McLaren kept racing. There'd been no wins in 1970, and there weren't any in 1971, but the team pulled itself together with absolute determination. In the face of the Lotus 72, McLaren built a new car for 72, the M23. Can-Am also saw new challenges, Porsche arriving with turbo power and forcing McLaren beyond their means, so they concentrated on Grand Prix racing. In 1972, the M23 was immediately quick, second in Argentina and first in South Africa. Hulm had wins in Sweden in 73 and Argentina in 74, always a top contender until he retired. Probably I was lazy. I should have probably tried a lot harder. Um, the fact that I only ever got one pole position probably proves that I can't qualify very well. But I do enjoy racing. I, I must admit I don't really enjoy qualifying. It's just a day out and as long as I get on the grid somewhere then I can have a, a bit of a burst in the race and pace myself a lot better than I probably can in qualifying. So, no, I enjoy the racing better than the, the practice. No, I don't really have any regrets. You can only be born at a certain period of time and you know you you know in my case i'm trying to extend my life as long as possible doing what i do and, and enjoy but uh, the money side of it it's all relative if you're talking about the sponsorship and the money that you hear prost and cena getting um a couple of years ago it was reputed to be six million this year it's 12. it's it, it's um needs they need it i think sterling moss always gave me a big rev about it because the amount of money we used in the, well, we won in the Can-Am series. And on a good day, we could win $25,000. And, you know, I'm talking about 1968. After 10 years in retirement, Denny came back into racing with saloon cars. In 1986, 20 years after his previous win, he won Britain's Tourist Trophy with young co-driver Jeff Allen in a Rover. Denny continued to race saloons right to the very end of his career. He was a tremendous competitor, but a friendly and pleasant man. A heart attack while racing in the 1992 Bathurst 1000 claimed him at the early age of 57. Today, McLaren, under the leadership of former Brabham mechanic Ron Dennis, is the byword for efficiency and high technology. McLaren is part owned by Daimler Chrysler. It's a long way from Bruce McLaren's hands-on approach reflecting just how much Grand Prix racing and motorsport has changed since Bruce passed away. Bruce McLaren and Denny Holm, New Zealand's famous racing sons. <laughs>